Hi, welcome to the Catalyst Sessions. It's our 100th show today. I'm very, very proud of that fact. We started this program in mid-March when everything kind of closed down as a way of keeping our arts community here in St. Petersburg a little closer together. I don't think any of us thought it was going to go this long, but we're going to keep doing it until we're all back together in the same room. But I'm happy to tell you that today's guest is Ephraim Sykes. Now, the great Angela Bassett might argue with this, and she's welcome to, but I think Ephraim Sykes is the most famous person to come out of St. Petersburg yet, and we're going to talk about some amazing things. Hello, sir. How you doing? All right. It is great to see your face here, and thank you for doing this. Let me run, let me run for the folks at home here a little bit of your credits, and then we'll get right to it. Uh, you may have seen him as CWJ Stubbs in NBC's Hairspray Live back on TV a couple of years ago. His Broadway credits include, and this is just a partial, The Little Mermaid, Motown the Musical, Newsies, which was a pretty cool movie back in the days, I remember. He's in <laughs> Hamilton. You can see him on Disney Plus right now as George Eaker. Unbelievable, the original Broadway cast of Hamilton. And he played David Ruffin in Ain't Too Proud, The Temptations musical. Now, David Ruffin was, was an absolute what can I say? He was a total badass and a great singer and a great dancer. And uh, Mr. Sykes here got a Tony nomination for that. Coming up next year, things go into the stratosphere as he has a starring role in MJ the Musical on Broadway. So having said that, welcome to the Catalyst Sessions. Thank you for having me and for that amazing uh, intro. <laughs> hey, man, that's, that's you. That's not me. You, you, you're, you're an alumnus of the Pinellas County Center for the Arts. Yes. Okay, and, and which is a big reason I wanted to talk to you. Tell me about that experience. I mean, was this something you wanted to do when you were really young? And, and how did they help facilitate it? Uh, to tell you the truth, it's, it's really weird. Uh, I, performing is something that I've always done, but it's never something that I had my goal set on. And it wasn't really until I got to uh, Pinellas County Center for the Arts, PCCA, that I really, of course, started to take it more seriously and start to see maybe that there was a chance for a career in it um, up until that point. And it wasn't, I would, I'll still say it wasn't until maybe my uh, junior or senior year there that I started to see, oh, that there's a possibility of making a living in the art. So that- What were you gonna be before that? Oh man, I wanted to be a baseball <laughs> player. I was gonna do all kinds of sorts of stuff. I also was, uh, I was a, and I still, I still am a musician as well, but music is kind of, has always been my first love. Yeah. Um, so I, I studied music all the way, you know, from elementary through high school there as well. My parents are, uh, uh, my father's a pastor. My, God, my mom's a singer and a musician. So they're both musicians. So that yeah. for me seemed like it was something that might've been, uh, I could e more easily see myself being a drummer for some artist or something like, you know what I mean? Those kind of uh, <laughs> ideas uh, which were much more prevalent in my head than what I ultimately have ended up doing, which is more of the Broadway uh, television and film stuff. So um, what, do, what do they do from when you're at the PCCA? Does somebody sort of recognize this talent in you and go, hey, come and audition for this show? Do did, did you have like a mentor who saw something in you? I can't even say that. I, I, I mean, I had my mentors. I, I was a dance major there. So dance is my primary focus. Yeah. Um, and I had two really, well, more than two, but two uh, primary teachers, Miss Pomerantsev, Suzanne Pomerantsev and Patricia sure. Page that ran the dance program. Uh, there, Patricia Page, who was still there. Um, and they definitely saw my talent as a dancer, especially. And they saw my talent in all the other, uh, uh, in all the other sort of crafts as well. But they just definitely pushed me. They taught me a lot about discipline. They taught me a lot about hard work. They taught me a lot about um, how to stay open as well, right? You know, I mean, not to, you know, of course, let dance be my focus, my main uh, priority, but they always were encouraging of me being able to study sort of inter interdisciplinary. Um, and that's something else that PCCA does really well. They encourage their students to not only focus on their main craft, but also expose yourself and share and meet and, you know what I mean, do the things as artists that really I, I find is, will make our careers, made my careers by being able to be open to communicate with and learn all the other disciplines. Well, you, you went through the, uh, the ALA Fordham dance program. You got BFA up there, right? So if I, if I read this correctly. So at that point, did you, were you, had you already shifted your focus? I'm go, I'm going to do TV. I'm going to do film. I'm going to go to Broadway. Um, 
when I was at Ailey, I knew I, I, I was kind of a bit tunnel vision, if I'm going to be honest with you, because once I got exposed to Alvin Ailey and that dance company, I was like, oh, wow, this is where I want to be. Yeah. Someplace I saw myself. I saw people that looked like me, uh, men that were black and uh, masculine, but still had this gorgeous technique and grace and all these other things that we don't normally see. Um, and it was a, Trump, a company that traveled all across the world, it does this amazing choreography. So uh, that became what my goal was, my, again, tunnel vision almost focus was. Now, in, that, in the midst of that, I always knew that I didn't want to just dance. I, I, I didn't mm. know how the other things would come about. I didn't know when or um, I just, I've always been, and I remember this since I was a little boy and being here in St. Petersburg, I knew that people would ask me what I wanted to be when I grow up and I'd be like, I don't know, I just want to do everything at the same time. So that for me meant playing basketball, football, baseball, dancing, held in my trumpet and saxophone and a drumsticks in my hand, somehow doing all of those things at the same time. <laughs> um, so once I, what ended up happening was um, I, I traveled with the Ailey 2 company for about two years. And that's like the junior company uh, that's right beneath the, the main company there. Sure, at Ailey. Yeah, yeah. And when it came to auditioning for the main company, it came down to beat me, like me and one other guy. And that year, they uh, ended up going with somebody else. And uh, so that kind of dream went away. That door closed. I auditioned for a few other dance companies because, again, I was kind of tunnel vision, not just Ailey, but concert dance in general, yeah. uh, that I would audition for these other companies. And a similar thing would happen where they, yo, we love you. We think you're great. We just don't have a space for you right now. This is not your year. This is not your moment. We don't have a place. So um i was really remember being really kind of down and not uh, in new york and not knowing what to do not having a job or any real source of income and you know it's an expensive city and i actually remember calling my dad and him telling me just to be patient and to be open to what could be next something new and different and be it was open. right around that's what they taught you at the pcca you said yeah exactly i had to i forgot that lesson until i was put in the fire so to speak and i had all these <laughs> closed doors around me yeah. um and then the the next thing that happened, I got a call from uh, this from Disney actually Disney Theatrical who runs all like The Lion King on Broadway and at the time The Little Mermaid, yeah. and it just so happened that one of the guys that choreographed on me in Ailey Two, uh, his assistant was one of the dance captains for The Little Mermaid. Long story short, they said, "Hey, uh, you should come audition for our show. Uh, be prepared to sing. Bring your book." They said, "I was like, I don't know what a book is." Uh, besides like <laughs> the books I read in school or the Bible or something like that. Uh, they said tap dance. They said be prepared to tumble. All these things I had never done before, but I was like, hey, it's an opportunity, so I'll give it a crack. And that became my first audition and my first Broadway show. And I never Is that back. one of those things when you say, yeah, of course I can tap. Yeah, it's like it, somebody's going into a movie, they say, well, you have to be able to ride a horse. I've been riding horses all my life, but had you never done like tumbling and tap before? That's exactly what happened. Like, uh, in fact, that's PCCA, great. I, I looked up, and my senior year of PCCA was my first time getting to do something even in the musical theater genre. Uh, they gave, they wanted me to play uh, Richie in a chorus line. Um, they're like, "You're a great dancer, but we know you don't tap. So here, take these." Your, I had some character shoes. They're like, "We're gonna uh, screw some taps into them, and they'll be your tap shoes." Didn't end up doing the production because of uh, time constraints with the uh, yeah. dance department. Uh, but I always kept those little raggedy, screwed-in tap shoes with me when I went to New York, just in case. And um, those are what I used for that audition. <laughs> Hamilton is on Disney Plus right now. And, and I saw you'd done, done some press when that happened and stuff. Um, can, can you tell the story uh, about how, I, I heard you tell this before, um, you, 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 when you went into that, who's going to watch a two and a half hour musical about Alexander Hamilton? <laughs> Who knew? Exactly. You know, can you talk about Hamilton a little bit? Yeah, sure. And it's a funny story. Like, actually, my uh, the girl I was seeing at the time, you know, I, I started doing Hamilton back in, I want to say 2014. Yeah. Um, it was very early. I did one of the first readings of it. Um, and I remember the, because I had already come into contact, I had worked with that creative team, Andy Blank and Bueller, Alex Sackmore, the choreographer, the music director, the director, Tommy Kiel. I worked with them on a couple other projects. Yeah. Uh, so they called me kind of directly and said, hey, we got this new project. We're doing a reading of it. We think you'd be great for it. Just come in and sing some stuff for us really quick. So I, that's how I became attached to that project. And I remember finally getting that script in, or that, that music, really, because there was no script. It's all music. Uh, and I remember getting it and being like, oh, my God this is literally about to 
change the world. This is about to change the game. I've never heard anything like this in a Broadway setting before. Yeah. And also it's a story that I never even heard of before, not even yeah. in like history classes. And I remember talking to my girlfriend at the time and being like, hey, this sounds crazy. You gotta come see this. We're doing like a hip hop mixtape musical about the life of Alexander Hamilton and the founding fathers. She's like, what? That sounds terrible. <laughs> what? <laughs> Just wait, I promise you, you're gonna be floored. And then she ends up coming to that reading uh, like a couple weeks later and she's in the back just in tears. And literally yeah. like, if you don't get me into the show, I'm gonna kill you and we're gonna break up. Uh, it, like, it, it, but I just remember it being like the most almost far-fetched idea, but the most brilliant thing I've actually had, had ever heard and how sort of, uh, how well-rounded it was, how much it just all actually ended up really making sense uh, in this perfect storm sort of a way. Um, yeah, man, and so it was just an honor to be attached from, from the beginning when, again, we were all in this small little space just reading it off the page and knew, we knew that we had something in our hands that was going to completely change the game on you multiple did. levels. So when it became the biggest thing since sliced bread, as my mother used right. to say, uh, you weren't surprised. But, you know, it literally changed well, Broadway. That's the thing, though. Like, uh, there was still a bit of surprise. And the thing is about Hamilton, we, keep, we call it the gift that keeps on giving because once you think it's topped itself, it somehow tops itself again in terms of, like, its mass appeal, in terms of how many more people it reaches, that, that whole thing, right? So we knew that in terms of Broadway, yeah, it's going to change the game. But Broadway is a sort of, uh, as big as an industry it is, it's still sort of a small sect of our in, in our entertainment industry. It's one of the smallest sections, I would say, uh, especially aside from TV, television and film. Um, so we didn't know the cultural impact it was going to end up having. So once we started off, you know, we did the reading, we did a workshop of it, and then got to Off-Broadway, which is a small 300-seat house. We, you know, we knew it was going to be great and people were going to love it. But all of a sudden, people are paying $3,000 for a ticket. All of a sudden, I remember one of our first, uh, one of our first uh, shows of it, our, one of our very first performances, Tom Hanks is in the audience, like smack dab in the middle. And he literally, after the show, is just hanging around outside of like our dressing room area, like by himself. We were like, yo, you're Tom Hanks. So, uh, wow, thank you for coming, blah, blah, blah. He's like, man, I heard about this. He's like, I had a hard time getting a ticket to see this. He's like, I almost had to sell my kids. He was like, you know, I mean, like, we realized that, again, the impact, of, and not, not just in terms of the level of celebrities and stars that were coming, but like, no, people that were hungry for what was this new piece of art. Um, and then, of course, that cut to Broadway, when all of a sudden now Hamilton is an actual household name. It's not just like, it didn't just break down Broadway's barriers and open up a new genre of uh, sort of storytelling and new Broadway shows, but like, no, there are kids that know about Hamilton and can sing every word of it. Their parents, and especially, I will say, uh, white people that had never even, supposed they never liked hip hop before, that know every single word to Hamilton. Like it yeah. shifted the culture of uh, America, of American storytelling, but also who's telling the stories that uh, our history, American history is all of our history, not just, you know, sometimes it can be seen as, you know, our, the forefathers can be kind of, especially as a black kid growing up, more for this white people's history. No, it's like, no, Hamilton shifted it. So no, it's all of our history now. Like, no, we have a part in this storytelling too. Your forefathers, sadly enough, and as uh, convoluted and complicated as it is, are our yeah. forefathers as well. And now we have this whole discussion about who gets to have ownership over the sort of the rights to this country again. Like this whole new discussion that, of course, then became uh, a highly politicized, uh, for better and for worse, uh, because that's exactly what this country is kind of fighting about right now, right? Yeah. So then you get yeah. uh, Barack Obama making speeches from our stage. You get a massive uh, Mike Pence showing up in a big, you know, speech towards him at the end of the show. Like this, I mean, uh, Hillary Clinton doing her the DNC. Like the, literally, it, the Hamilton became a staple and a talking point for the whole entire country all of a sudden, and that we could have never seen that coming. And now the a pandemic hits and they release the movie on Disney Plus. And millions and millions of more people now are exposed to this thing. So the it just keeps up continues, itself. Yeah. yeah, it just keeps up in itself. Let's transition into into uh, into proud. Um, I'm I'm a lot older than you, and I remember watching the temps on like the Ed Sullivan show and stuff. And uh, nobody could dance like that. I know you've seen the videos, and you did a Absolutely. lot of studying. Um, how many shows did you do? I mean, too proud. I know it's it, oh my god. Um, a lot. How many did I do? Yeah, it was a hell of a lot. I mean, because we started that show, uh, 
<clears throat> I want to say 2017. Um, so I did it almost for three years. And we had multiple cities before it came to Broadway. We started off in Berkeley, California. It then went to the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. We went to L.A. and Toronto, all before coming to Broadway. So that was like a two-year stint of doing that show for the most part, even before we got to Broadway. And then I did a whole year on Broadway, which, you know, uh, most people, you know, Broadway shows about eight shows a week, right? Yeah. That's a lot of math. But, That's... Um, <laughs> Well, it's a lot of shows, but it, it's it's a very physical show from you know what I've seen, and and I, I wanted to ask you about that because eight shows a week, how do you, what do you do to keep your stamina up? I mean, you know, my God, oh, that uh, the, yeah. it's so dance heavy. <laughs> my, well, that's the the beauty and blessing of growing up a dancer. Honestly, PCCA trained me for this uh, long ago when I was dancing. Uh, all day every day from you know what i mean from yeah. seven o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock at night especially when i got to ailey there was that even more so so yeah. i've been doing that sort of caliber of dancing actually uh my whole life for the most part and it's and i've done much harder dancing like you know what i mean ain't too proud people saw me doing that stuff and yeah i did some crazy tricks and things like that and it was very hard on my body for sure but the things i was doing the newsies was way harder than that you know what i mean the things i was doing <laughs> the other shows when i was just a dancer before i had a role really uh, you know, the uh, shout outs to all the ensemble dancers, we call them. Uh, the, yeah. A lot of times the dancers that you see in the back of these performances that are working their butts off and nobody even really understands uh, or appreciates the amount of work that that is. So that all really trained me um, to be able to be prepared for this, how to take care of my body, how to get enough rest, uh, how to stretch before and after every show, how to properly warm up and take care. Like I knew I could, I could enter that role and that show as a dancer dancer like i used to be back in the day and yeah. therefore i've known how to the upkeep the amount of rest and the amount of uh true sort of maintenance uh that goes into that how many times a week i was getting massage therapy almost every day of the week like at intermission i had my physical therapist come into my dressing room and like peel my neck open and my ribs to get me to be able to breathe again like oh, the things that you do preemptively to keep going for that long but it's like you're not out partying at night, you know. This is a, a oh, serious no. gig. Yeah, I, I wasn't a saint either. I'm not going to tell that lie. But uh, <laughs> there, because there's a level to it that, uh, for me, it's this is a spiritual art form. So if I become a complete monk, then I'm not going to be happy on the inside, and I'm going to be angry and resentful and tortured. So there's I hear that. Yeah, yeah. Like, go ahead, live your life and know how to do it. Tired. You know what I mean? Like, you're going to be tired regardless. So it's always going to be about pushing through. Um, so you got to be able to live your life. You got to know that sometimes when you're, I've, I've always been able to uh, do my shows when I, uh, I say running on E, <laughs> when I have nothing mm -hmm. left in the tank and you got to make it happen anyway. And you know, you learn how to perform even more efficiently. So that's what I really learned. Did you ever drop the microphone? You, you were in a, <laughs> did you? Absolutely. Man, it was a crazy <laughs> thing. Man. Like, thank God, more often, I would say, being realistic, I would say eight to nine times out of 10, I caught it. But there were yeah. those two times out of the 10 where that mic would go flying into the audience or something like that. And people are ducking and dodging. But the funniest thing about live theater, man, is just like people actually enjoy watching somebody uh, mess up a bit, but then recover. It's how you recover, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, so I had a trick I would do whenever I dropped the mic. I had a trick mic stashed away in my pocket somewhere. And whenever I drop the mic, I still do the split and come up and I turn around, I pull this trick mic out and the audience will go nuts even more so than when I caught it. <laughs> People were like, well, can you just keep dropping the mic? Cause they like it better. Uh, but uh, yeah, man, I did it all the time. What's that like to get a Tony nomination? I mean, were you, were you stunned? Were you like about time or what's that like? <laughs> no, for me, absolutely surreal. Stunned is maybe, closer to the more appropriate word, stunned, shocked, uh, in tears. Because again, like I told you, where I, how I grew up, where I come from, uh, mm -hmm. and it's how I envisioned my life. I never even had my sights set on Broadway at all. I didn't know what a Tony Award was till a few years back, you know? Um, let alone to finally get a chance at a role. And who would have thought I'd ever have a leading role on Broadway? Like I never dreamt these things for myself. So for all of a sudden to have come that far, and woken up that morning to my name being announced for a Tony Award. It was just like, I, again, it was it, it broke me down in the way that like, uh, when you realize you can't even dream, when God will bless you so big that you couldn't even dream as big as God's blessing or God's plan. Like they said, your plans are never as big as God's plans for you, right? Like yeah. my wildest dreams couldn't even reach 
<laughs> the, the, <laughs> the beginning of God's plan. Uh, so it was, I mean, the most surreal moment, man. And just, uh, it, it still shakes me when I think about it because it's almost, it's, almost it's almost too much to receive. It's overwhelming. Who was the first person you called? Uh, I was actually, I think I called my uh, two of my best friends that are in the show with me, Derek Baskin and Jeremy Pope, because they were both nominated uh, yeah. alongside me that in that same moment. And we all had a similar experience. We, because they announced our names pretty much one after the other. And we all just called our, each other and were just like <laughs> in our beds because it was eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, in our beds, just crying, <laughs> just like trying to talk ourselves that, yo, this is real. This is really happening. And somehow trying to believe that we deserve it that, you know, appreciating that we did work that hard and, you know, these kind of dreams come true. And then the next call was with my dad. Um, yeah. And I remember my dad really said something that helped me uh, sort of understand the gravity of it. Uh, because I've always been a person, I don't really care about awards. They don't really, they've never really meant a lot to me. Like I, I appreciate the honor, but that's not at all why I do what I do. And uh, my dad called and he told me, uh, he started telling me about, he started getting a number of phone calls in St. Pete from parents saying, hey, we saw what your son has just done. My son wants to give it a try. My son is good at this. How can they get in? There's this new level of uh, kids that look like me, uh, that even don't look like me, but that come from my hometown, uh, come from where I come from, that now see this is a possibility for them. And that, yeah. I mean, the world to me, you know what I mean? You open up a kid's eyes to new possibilities, to, you know, maybe, I don't know, that kind of inspiration uh, that some of these kids are getting, is just, that meant more than the award to me. You're a role model. Hey, I wanted to ask you uh, one thing, one more thing about Ain't Too Proud. Dominique Morisot wrote the book there. And now, by right. now you know what a book is. Um, you, they've done quite a few of her shows down here, Pipeline and, and a couple of others. Yep. Uh, and uh, Skeleton Crew, which was just brilliant. Um, yeah. And also MJ was written by Lynn Nottage. And, and, and be, uh, does that, does that kind of elevate those shows? outside of just being the old jukebox musicals, why is it important to have somebody who's such a, such a craftsperson create yeah. the script? Well, they say with Broadway, um, Broadway, your, your show's only as good as the book, they say, pretty much. Uh -huh. um, and the, the, the sad part about it is, and sometimes the good part, is that when it comes to Broadway shows, people will come and enjoy them just because they enjoy some singing and dancing, and sometimes the books can be lackluster, especially for a jukebox musical. Yeah. Um, so well, yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, exactly. They don't care about the story as much. These people pay their money to come hear their favorite songs and watch people impersonate or dance like their favorite, you know, old memories of their favorite artists, uh, yeah. which for me is, you know, it's great. And it'll make a lot of money for a lot of these producers and things like that. But it doesn't for me as an artist and for us as an artistic community, it does a disservice, uh, I think, to the people that we're trying to uh, pay homage to. Um, yeah. We're trying with the Temptations, with Ain't Too Proud, you know, Dominique Morisot, she born and raised Detroit. You know what I mean? This is her life's blood. Her family knew those guys. They all grew up on the same blocks. And, you know, especially, I'll say, when it comes to uh, uh, Black communities and, and Black artists and stuff like that, we don't want to just continue to sing and dance for people. Like, we got deep, dark, in, uh, in a, uh, very complicated histories. Our, our work as artists is to humanize these people, to make you realize their humanity not just what you see them do on a TV screen, not with just the songs that you love that you clap along to, but the pain that they went through, the struggles that they went through. Uh, you know what I mean? We gotta tell, we gotta tell the whole story. Oh man, the temptation story. Music. Yeah. Did you ever see that VH1 movie that Otis did on the Champs? Oh yeah, man. I watched that movie over and over again. I, I love that. I thought that was great. That's yeah. how I know about Paul and and all and and Ruffin's story and all of that. Yeah, truth be told, man, that's how a lot of people uh have come to know their story and the ins and outs of it um and you know it was so well done and I, that for me and especially for people like dominique and for uh lynn Nottage, is the yeah. bare minimum of what we should be striving towards when we do these so-called jukebox musicals though they like to call them as uh sort of like a biopic you know what i mean like we yeah. want to look at it like a biography pretty much of these people's lives that the music therefore is intertwined and helps us tell their stories well it elevates to elevates the story from just not being just a jukebox musical when you get people of, of your caliber and all the other guys that were doing the temps and have a really great script too then it's a much more immersive experience i think for the audience i did want to talk uh briefly about mj because um it was well because of the pandemic and you're sitting there i'm sitting here 
none of us are really working right now. I'm just, I'm enjoying talking to you. But this was, was this almost ready to go when the pandemic hit? I mean, we were supposed to start rehearsals, what was it, in June. Uh, actually, no, May. Um, and I was supposed to, I had a, a series of like training sessions for weeks with the choreography, okay. all that kind of stuff. We did a workshop back in, it was October uh, for two months. Um, and yeah, our opening night was supposed to be a few nights ago, actually. Just a couple nights ago was wow. supposed to be our opening night on Broadway. So it was going full steam ahead. Like we're still, even when the pandemic hit, originally, I don't know if you remember, they're like, okay, well, we're, uh, we're going to go ahead and say every, everybody needs to shut down for about two weeks, right? And they were like, mm -hmm. oh, maybe a month. So everything, Broadway got shut down until March, they said at first. March, whatever it was. Then yeah. they pushed back to, all right, well, it's shut down to April. So uh, all through that time, MJ was like, you guys, you know, we know it's a pandemic, but, you know, thank God our dates still work out that, you know, we should be able to quarantine. This country is shut down. And then once everything subsides, we'll open back up. We'll be good to go on schedule. But as we see... Things continued on, things continue to unfold. I mean, and now we're looking at, you know, our opening isn't until April of this coming, you know, spring. So, you know, yeah, we were looking to go full steam ahead, but honestly, it was such a blessing uh, for me to be able to have, because you, like you said, that Ain't Too Crowd was a hell of a uh, show to do. And I was, uh, man, my, did my body, my mind, my spirit need the break, actually. This kind well, of time. The thing is, Efren, if, if, you, if you've got MJ up here, all the songs and the moves and the dialogue. Uh, how's your muscle memory? Can you, uh, is it all still going to be? I mean, at some point you got to start rehearsing again. It's not all just going to come back to you. Oh, of course. And to be honest with you, um, as much as I've been able to take my rest um, and enjoy it, I have not let MJ slip my grasp at all. I'm still taking two voice lessons a week. I'm still watching videos all day, every day. I'm, I set up my apartment in Harlem to be kind of like a little studio. I put a mirror out there so I can keep practicing my moves. I mean, I'm, it just is giving me more time to rest, but also to train towards, uh, I'm, I don't want to say perfecting because there's no way to possibly perfect that man. There's no way to possibly yeah. truly emulate that man. Uh, but it gives me more time to at least get closer to him. You know what I mean? And get as close and as dig as deep as I, because the thing, the difference, I had David Ruffin, like I said, I did David Ruffin for, for two whole years before I even got to Broadway. Yeah. MJ was about to happen in a matter of months. And, David Ruffin and Michael Jackson could not be further from each other in their sound, <laughs> in their personality, in the oh, way they yeah. move. Uh, and I needed a, I still need all this time to train and to figure it out. You know what I mean? So again, that's been the blessing of this downtime. Now, Michael, when you were young, younger, I should say, Michael was like, you'll pardon the expression, the shit. Michael was it, man. I mean, was he an inspiration to you? I mean, he was an absolute musical genius. Michael was my, and still is, my biggest inspiration, my biggest yeah. artist. I would have never sang or danced at all, ever, if it wasn't for Michael Jackson. Really. He was the first person I ever saw sing or dance. Yeah. And he's still, to me, uh, it, then nobody can touch him. Nobody's ever come along that is a greater singer. Nobody's ever come along that's a greater dancer. Nobody's ever come along that literally has as massive and wide range of catalog as this man has. But even more so than that, for me, why he was such a huge inspiration and really a hero to me, uh, nobody was as, uh, ever has been a big humanitarian as him. And I remember yeah. as a kid, not only watching him sing and dance on stage, but like he would go around the world and literally like give so much. He taught people how to love, you know what I mean? Like he gave so much to everybody, you know what I mean? The charities and organizations, like he was this huge selfless, like humanitarian hero to me as well. Um, so he's meant so much to me in like as an artist, but even as a person growing up, yeah. you know what I mean? Well, you know, we all know that from what we've heard that Michael, you personally wasn't a, a saint, but he was a, like an incredible entertainer. And I think in, in all those things you just mentioned, he certainly meant well and was a great influence on a lot, a lot of people. One last question, because we're just about done. I'm going to let you go here. I'm sure you've got somewhere to go. Um, unlike me, I'm just going to go have lunch. <laughs> hey, um, because that's coming up, and I don't know when I'll get the chance to speak to you again, Ephraim, uh, do you have this feeling somewhere in your bones that this is going to be huge? This is going to take my career to another level. I, I'll be honest with you, and yes, in my bones, I do feel something like that. And the thing is, when it's like this kind of feeling, it's... 
it, it's not going to be how I envisioned it either, right? It's not going to be, oh, because the show is the greatest thing. Like, this show is going to be a uh, smash. I, I do believe that, like, you know, what we've been cooking up and, uh, yeah. oh, my gosh, this cast. Uh, and, th again, the intentions of the show and what the, the conversations that is, I think it's trying to have or the questions it's trying to bring up, I think it's going to really do some, some huge uh, work and, uh, I don't know, Oh man, I don't know, but yeah, something's something's a brewing, and I, I it's it's huge, man, and I just I'm excited for it, and it, but I'm excited for it to again it to be different than what I can dream or expect, and that's always been the most fun place to live for me. Well, for me, what I'm saying is, you know, in a year from now, when I try to get you back to do another one of these interviews, I'm not going to be able to get within 20 feet of you. you know? <laughs> well, you got, so, you got the right one originally by calling my dad, so you, yeah. you know, if you get to have your previous PD if you get to me. <laughs> hey, I, you know, I'm a, I think we're, uh, I think I'm going to end it because that, that's a half an hour. Can't thank you enough, uh, Ephraim Sykes, and wishing you continued success. And are you, uh, are you in St. Pete now or are you in, you're in New York? I'm actually in Bradenton right now. Oh, there you go. I saw yep. the palm trees behind you and I said, I don't think that's Harlem, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sadly, no. All right, man. Thank you so very much. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you soon, I hope. Yep, absolutely. Thank you so much for this. Take care, my friend. Have a good one.